You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. and by viewers like you. In many ways, 2010 was a dramatic year in the life of the Jewish community. And on this round table, we continue our look at some of the Jewish events which will impact the Jewish future. As we're joined again by Neil Schur, a former director of APAC, the past head of the U.S. Justice Department's Office of Special Investigations, which tracked Nazi war criminals in the United States. And Neil is currently a lawyer in private practice in New York. Benjamin Buddy Korn, a past director of the media watchdog Camera, and a past editor of a Jewish exponent in Philadelphia, and the founder of the website Jews for Sarah, which informs American Jews of the policy positions taken by Sarah Palin. And Buddy Korn also hosts Jewish Independent Talk Radio in Greater Philadelphia and available on the internet. Ron Skolnick, Executive Director of Merits USA, a leading progressive Zionist organization with links to Israel's Merits Party. And Dr. Stephen Baim, Director of the Contemporary Jewish Life Department of the American Jewish Committee and of the Kabbalman Institute on American-Jewish-Israeli Relations. All sharing opinion on this edition of Roundtable. All right, I want to talk about Judaism in Israel for one moment. In 2010, on January 6th, Anat Hoffman, leader of Israel's Women of the Wall, was virtually arrested at the Western Wall for conduct which violated the ultra-Orthodox standards at the Western Wall. Then in June, we have the Rotem Conversion Bill, which caused an explosion in, on the American Jewish scene in terms of American Jews frightened to death that the chief rabbinate of Israel was going to delegitimize non-Orthodox Jewry here in the United States, an utterly spurious concern. And lastly, no less a um, major columnist than Izzy Liebler has re recently called for the dissolution of the chief rabbinate of Israel. Izzy Liebler, of course, is an Orthodox Jew and a major Jewish leader on the world Jewish scene. In general, would the four of you give me your sense of the feeling as we live through 2010 about orthodoxy in Israel and how it does or does not seem to distance the state of Israel from American Jewry? Stephen? Look, we have seen a, a transformation inside the ultra-orthodox world that is of uh, enormous significance. I say ultra-orthodox as opposed to orthodox or modern orthodox for a variety of reasons, but to focus sharply on the Haredi world, there's been one major transformation. And that is, until about the 1980s, their agenda was very much of a protectionist status quo agenda. Their sense was that Israeli society is moving against us, it's moving in a more secular direction, and therefore our objective is to hold on to what we have. Now, American Jews may have had some problems with that, many Israeli Jews had problems with it, but they were not existential problems. In the last 25 years, in the last generation, it's very clear that ultra-orthodoxy is far stronger than it ever imagined itself would be in Israel. Uh, it's growing numerically for obvious reasons in terms of demography and birth rate. The agenda has become a much more action-oriented agenda, not about protecting the status quo, but about transforming Israeli society. That should be of concern to every Jew anywhere, any place. Um, I don't think there is any real danger, if you will, that Israeli democracy will be held hostage uh, to ultra-Orthodoxy. But what it's fair to say is that uh, we will see more in the way of extreme statements, whether it's against selling uh, apartments or renting apartments to non-Jews, uh, against uh, 
presence of women on the Western Wall, against the presence of conservative reform Judaism in Israel. Those statements will resonate very negatively. Inside the ultra-Orthodox world, I'm afraid the, uh, the triumphalist vision has, uh, has um, taken root, namely, we'll be around here long after mm -hmm. your kids have married out mm -hmm. and have disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, you really have a clash, if you will, between the ultra-Orthodox vision and the non-ultra-Orthodox vision. Where the modern Orthodox are in all this is a very interesting question because theoretically they could be the bridge. They have not done so as yet. Now you, buddy, are not an ultra-Orthodox Jew. You're part of the Jewish community, and part of the Orthodox Jewish community. But I'd be curious to hear how from an Orthodox perspective, not necessarily ultra-Orthodox, you view what's going on in Israel in terms of the clash between the ultra-Orthodox part of the Israeli society and mainstream Israeli society as well. First of all, I, I would just like to say I think it's a bad idea to use the expression ultra-Orthodox. Why is that? Because it is a term which is offensive to the people to whom it is applied. What's a better term? Haredi. Haredi. Okay, Haredi, Haredi is accepted uh, by the so-called ultra-Orthodox in Israel. It's also accepted here. I understand it's a Hebrew term with which right. many may not be familiar. And that's the but that's our it. no, no, uh, because that's educate. our job is we to educate, educate people. Fine, fine. That's right. Okay. okay. So having said that, um, let's first of all look at the position of the Haredi. Well, what does Haredi mean? Uh, it means Quakers. It means trembling. So okay. I, I'm from Philadelphia, so I can say it means Quakers. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, the uh, first of all, what is the position demographically of Haredi Judaism within Israeli societies as a whole and within Israeli orthodoxy, so to speak, <clears throat> as a whole. So-called modern Orthodox Jews, the knitted yarmulke group, the non-black hat Jews, the non-Haredi Jews, outnumber the Haredi community by about two to one within Israel. So even though the Haredi community has a much higher birth rate, it's a much higher birth rate within a context of a Jewish, of an Orthodox community, which is much larger than they are. So they are functioning within that context. Now, I agree with what Stephen was saying, that so far, the Mizrahi, the modern Orthodox community within Israel, have not played the bridging role that uh, they could have played within the Haredi community and uh, the more secular, although that's a whole issue too, because I think that those Jews who consider themselves really define themselves as secular within Israeli society, Dafka is a small group, and that what you have is a gradation of Jewish identity, Jewish observance, and so forth across the population of so-called secular Jews who are keeping different rituals like a Passover Seder, a mezuzah, a fast on Yom Kippur, whatever it might be. Okay. There are two really divisive issues regarding the Haredim with Israeli society outside of issues of conversion, of religious status at the Kotel or whatever. And those issues are service in the army exactly. and a lifetime uh, presence in government subsidized yeshivas ver versus entering the job market. When sure. the senior staff of the American Jewish Committee gathers uh, every other week or so, 40% uh, of the people present are Orthodox. That's the American Jewish Committee, hardly known as a bastion of Orthodoxy. Uh, and our lay leadership, I won't say it's anywhere near 40%, but uh, without question, on, on, on all levels, junior and senior levels, there are key Orthodox figures. What is missing? Uh, is anyone who is from what you broadly might describe as the Haredi sector. You mentioned before the Jewish press, Yated Neman, Hamodia. My late colleague, Mark, Rabbi Mark Tannenbaum, used to tell me, you have to read the Jewish press every week. <laughs> well, I, I, I for a while did until I got too nauseated by it, to put it bluntly. Um, we were criticized a good number of times by them for totally uh, irrational reasons. In that context, I think you're correct in saying, given the significance of orthodoxy and its growing importance, Yes, efforts must be made to bring Orthodox leadership into our deliberations. But it's got to be a two-way street. And when you have things like the Rotem Bill, for example, where uh, a modern Orthodox figure such as Rotem came to American Jewry, said, uh, I, uh, I really want your support on something and I want to listen. And he goes away and leaves everyone with the impression that, his, that he's been given uh, uh, a good deal of wisdom about why this bill was a bad idea, because it cements a monopoly of the chief rabbinate uh, over issues of conversion. And then he dismisses us by saying, well, they're acting like a bunch of idiots anyway. 
Uh, so in that sense, it's, it really needs to be a two-way street, and I don't see it at present. On the contrary, I see a triumphalist ethos within orthodoxy that basically says, we're going to be around a lot longer than you are. So you guys better get used to us rather than we get used to you. Is I agree in, with that is, criticism. Is this endangering the, the relationship between Israel and American Jewry? Okay, that's a, that's a difficult question. I think it can be, really can be read two ways. Um, it certainly is endangering the depth of attachment by committed American Jews. I'm not talking about uncommitted ones or the people that Peter Biden not necessarily is talking about who couldn't care less one way or another. But among committed Jewish activists who are conservative and reform, I think their depth of attachment is weaker. That said, what there is no compromise on is the issue of Israeli security, where those same people will say, we are, we are totally committed to a strong relationship between America and Israel, and we're totally committed to the security of Israel. So the answer is not black or white. It's, it's yes and no at the same time. I, I, uh, on the issues you've raised, uh, the conversion bill uh, in certain quarters in the, in the diaspora in this country is a problem. But on the other issues, uh, I don't see it draining support by the pro, from the pro-Israel community. Anybody who goes to Israel sees it's a vibrant, diverse uh, uh, culture and country. Everything and everything uh, can be found there. And there are internal fights within uh, the state as to uh, service in the military about supporting yeshiva. People don't enter the job market. That doesn't affect the American Jews, I don't think. Uh, the people who are going to visit Israel, are going to support Israel, uh, don't pay attention to that all that carefully. That, that's my sense. Okay. Any other comments? Um, I'm not going to speak for the, you know, the, the American Jewish community. I think it's a kind of an amorphous term. It's made up of millions of people. Um, I will say this, that um, more and more what I think is going on in Israel in terms of the Haredi public and others is what I would call the post, the Haredi public, uh, and it might be a, a sort of a, a small nuance, but it was never a Zionist, part of the Zionist world, and I think that that's what we're seeing right now. Um, so to say it's a post-Zionist move might be flawed, but the question comes down to what is Zionism and what is Israel? Is Israel a home for the Jewish people, or is it a home for the people who live in it? Now, strong arguments might be made on both sides. What I think David Rotem, and I actually also met with him in the Knesset, what David Rotem wanted to say is, we have real people, real citizens. You guys aren't citizens. So it's all well and good, and I came and I did listen, but you're citizens of another country. I was working for my constituency, which was uh, primarily people from the former Soviet Union, not modern Orthodox and not Haredi. And uh, your interests here are interests. Go deal with your religious freedom in the United States. And that is a, a not in the, in the sort of loaded way we say post-Zionism. That's a post-Zionist viewpoint. Israel is not for world Jewry. You, you are lesser, in my eyes, than um, the citizens of Israel, or at least the Jewish citizens of Israel, according to in his vision. Um, so that's a question that American Jewry will have to deal with. Um, the wall, I mean, I think that, that viewers will want to know that the, the Hakotel was not always considered a, a Haredi Bet Knesset. It used to be a national symbol, and it has become redesignated over the years. So, and I think that it will turn off people. And I'm not speaking as a reform or conservative. I'm neither. I'm a secular Jew. Um, but I think it's very important, and I think that that will be a question. Is Israel still the place for world Jewry, or is it a place for Israel's citizens? And I think that these are, these are the beginnings of a trend. I don't think these should, be, these should be written off as little blips on the radar. I think we'll see more of this as time goes on and as the number of years uh, that Israel exists. We're 62, we're in our 63rd year now, as we keep going on. And I think we'll see that, uh, that tension there. At the beginning of the year, 2010, there was an earthquake that hit Haiti. And one of the dramatic things that happened was the State of Israel sent medical crews in established a hospital before virtually anybody else did so. And it seemed to be one of the events of 2010 from the Jewish perspective that was celebrated roundly. Anybody want to comment? I, th I think that there's so much to be proud of over Israel's conduct. And I think even more than that, um, we really, as a community here in America, have not apprehended hardly at all, what a stunning success Israel is in almost every avenue of human endeavor. One could start with the military, although it's unpopular here. One could go to the economy, 
to uh, technology, to social services, to uh, green revolution, to medicine, to law, to arts, and so on and so forth. This idea that Israel is somehow a, uh, a settlement movement backed by a symphony orchestra is just absurd. And so, you know, as, as American Jews, um, we came up thinking that Israel was essentially a, a child, a, a charity case, something that needed to be nurtured along, and if we were good American Jews, we gave and we gave. And this is not to negate the altruism of American Jews in all of this. It was a magnificent and, and remains a magnificent effort. But the child has grown. We need Israel today as American Jews more than they need us. And one of the developments that has happened here on the American scene, whether we can uh, adjust to it or not, in four years, the American evangelical community has created the largest pro-Israel organization outside of the state of Israel. In four years, John Hagee's Christian United for Israel has gone from zero to half a million members. And this is why we are sitting here. Um, we uh, have not touched on the American Jewish uh, communal attitude towards Islam, which is a major issue on our scene today. I think that American uh, Jews often would feel more uh, comfortable doing outreach to people whom they perceive to be moderate Muslim representatives than to representatives of the Haredi community in Israel. That's a harsh statement to make, but I think that it is unfortunately true. We feel more alienated from our ultra-Orthodox brethren than from Imam Raouf. And I think that this is a statement about where the American Jewish leadership is at. We have missed, with all our magnificent efforts, I don't want to take a single thing away from anyone who is at this table or the people who have worked with them. The, the, the work of APAC, of American Jewish Committee, I will even say of American Friends of Merits, has been dedicated, altruistic, wonderful. Everybody could have been playing cards or watching the football game instead. Okay, but so many crucial issues that we have not begun to address. I'm, I'm sorry, but I feel that our communal conversation, even among our, our leadership, is really on, almost on a primitive level considering the situation we face, how fast things are developing, and what we really need to enact if we are going to face as a leadership, the 21st century. I think we're, 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 we're barely past the starting line. It's, it's good to discuss the Rotem Bill, conversions and issues of personal status. But the question of, what if it is true that Israel and the diplomatic process will move forward better without our intervention than with it? What is the meaning of the emergence of a gigantic movement of evangelical Christian support concretized into organizations? And all of these things are enormous things. And yes, we should feel good about what the, the Israelis did in Haiti. We should feel good about what they do every day. It is a magnificent achievement of Israeli society. It's just a, a, astonishing to me. And, and I think that we really haven't gotten the message. And I think we're sitting here discussing whether or not young Jews feel alienated from Zionism and, oh, I don't know how to feel good about being a supporter of Israel. Well, how are we educating them? Where is the Peter Beinart effort to say, friends, I understand your discomfort at Israel, but as an educated person, as a former editor of the New Republic, let me tell you why you should be supporting this magnificent example of liberal democracy in a sea of tyranny and intolerance. Yeah, why isn't he doing that? Ask him. No, I'm asking you. Because... There is, I said it before, there is an immature attitude. There is an attitude that says, you know, remember these uh, magazines when we were kids, Highlights for Children, and they had these uh, pages in there and you were supposed to uh, uh, um, um, indicate what was missing from a photo. So there was a, a, a cow with three legs and there was a goat without a tail and there was a chicken with two heads and you were supposed to say, okay, this is what's wrong with this picture. That's, uh, you know, what a child does. But to sit down and say, given the responsibility for improving the situation, how do we make things better? That's a higher level. That's a higher madrega. I'm saying Beinart isn't there.
let me be the cynic here. I put him, Beinhardt, in many ways in the same category as Walt and Mearsheimer. Beinhardt has become a rock star. Beinhardt is making a fortune. And if anyone doesn't think that that didn't enter into the picture, he's no, he has marketed himself, he has people marketing him, and I think it's very naive to say to think that that is not a factor, and maybe even the most significant motivating factor. Walt and Mearsheimer, no one ever heard of these guys. One was at Harvard, one was in Chicago. They were academicians. All of a sudden, they write this article in, in the London uh, newspaper, and now they're getting, they, they, they get tens of thousands to speak, and that is a major, major consideration. In 2010, the American Jewish Congress closed down. What's it mean? Well, one corrective, first of all, uh, I don't think they closed down. That's certainly not the official line. The official line is they've suspended operations. I thought they were <laughs> so, out of business. No, the official line is suspended operations. Therefore, I think. Are the lights still on? Um, I think it remains to be seen whether they will come back and, and in what form. Right, how words, do you describe it better then? What, what would you say? I would the American say Jewish Congress in 2010 has, suspend, has suspended operations. Oh, okay, now. suspended no, operations. Okay. What's it what mean? What does that mean? First of all, it means that the. Uh, uh, American Jewish Congress yet. Yes, an organization that has uh, attracted some of the major luminaries uh, in American Jewish history, whether it's Brandeis, Frankfurter, uh, Chief uh, Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg, Stephen Wise, Stephen Wise one, of the, one of the leading rabbis. Uh, in that sense, they succeeded in bringing in people over the years that accomplished enormous good for the Jewish people. To lose that legacy is a setback. That's number one. Number two, uh, is that uh, the Congress over the years had done a great deal of uh, positive work on issues of First Amendment, civil rights, uh, in more recent years on foreign policy, including defense of Israel. The work of uh, uh, their former executive director, uh, Phil Baum, was, was remarkable in terms of foreign affairs. So therefore, frankly, um, notwithstanding the fact that I worked for an organization that uh, oftentimes was in, um, in competition, if you will, and sometimes with loggerheads, uh, I regard this as a uh, significant loss for the Jewish community. Um, if we cannot sustain an organization like the American Jewish Congress, it speaks, frankly, to what I call the underlying problem, which uh, even Buddy is not referenced here, and that is the assimilation of American Jews. Uh, assimilated community means a weaker American Jewish community, and that will affect us on all levels. Is it about money? Well, certainly economics drives a great deal, but um, what, I, what I'm pointing to is that um, uh, We've had a difficult economic climate in recent years, and that certainly has, has again, impacted upon decision-making here. Um, but I think the, uh, the larger question is, uh, is the issue of American Jewish uh, communal priorities, American Jewish investments. Um, there's no shortage of money out there. The question is, is will it advance the collective causes of the Jewish people? Uh, one, again, one set of data is that right now, uh, only 20% of Jewish philanthropy uh, is targeted towards Jewish ends. Um, well, that's a sad commentary on American Jewry. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, if you're talking about what really ails us and what really ails Peter Beinart, uh, I don't believe it's the uh, 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 difficulties with Israeli politics and policies. What I do think what really ails us is an insufficient commitment uh, to sustaining the Jewish enterprise, or to put it a somewhat different way, uh, why did Brandeis and Frankfurter enter into Jewish life? They had succeeded in Americans, as Americans, and they decided they need to, needed to give back to where they came from, the Jewish community. Today, we've entered into all circles of power, from the heads of networks to uh, heads of government to uh, any position you can imagine, whether it's media, the arts, politics, culture, you have it. The question is, having done so, will the Jewish cause matter sufficiently that people of that caliber will continue to devote their energies there? I'm doubtful because I think the, re the reality of assimilation has taken a much larger toll mm -hmm. than anyone was care to imagine. And that, frankly, buddy, is what we're not willing to discuss because that means the problem is with inside us and not somewhere else. You know, uh, the, the demise of the AJ uh, Congress, uh, I'm not sure that's reflective of, of, of uh, a downward trend of commitment towards Jewish organizational life. I think the, the Congress had a very fundamental problem in that they didn't, to use a, a common word. They didn't have a brand. People didn't know what the Congress did. They couldn't distinguish it, for example, from the AJ committee. Not just because you had the same initials. They didn't know. They didn't have a unique quality. And, and, 
anybody who, who has run Jewish organization knows that you have to be able to stake out uh, a uniqueness. You know, the ADL does it, APAC does it, AJ Committee does it. Uh, the Congress was struggling of late, uh, and, and it, it was sad, but uh, I'm not sure it's reflective of, of any, great, any great trend. Uh, there are plenty of organizations out there that people support, and I, I agree with you, Steve. I, you know, you, you walk through the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a great place. Every one of the halls is, is dedicated, or was dedicated by a Jew or Jewish family. Uh, and uh, I didn't realize the figures were, that 20% figure startles me, but, uh, and that's, that's significant. The Jewish Agency in 2010 redefined its mission and goal from saving Jews all over the world to basically focusing on building Jewish identity both in Israel and the diaspora, both in Israel and the diaspora. What do you think about the Jewish Agency redefining itself? Well, I think, um, I think it's very uh, interesting, again, uh, in, in light of my comments about Zionism, that the Jewish Agency, uh, not only the Jewish Agency, movements within Israel that were historically Aliyah movements have ceased to be that. Um, and, and we've certainly, certainly turned some kind of corner, and as, as, it, is, as it is with corners, we don't always know what's around the corner. Um, but I think that both in Israel and in the United States, there's an increase in coming to terms with what might be called a bipolar in the sense of two poles, not in the sense of, of, of a manic depressive, a bipolar Jewish existence of a strong Jewish community, hopefully in the United States, that is not being called upon in any uh, ideological way to relocate to Israel as part of Aliyah, and an Israeli Jewish uh, community. And I think that what the Jewish agency is doing is, is part of that, is part of that. I think there are three dimensions of this. Um, number one, it reflects a statement that we're about Jewish peoplehood mm -hmm. and sustaining Jewish peoplehood. Which is good. That is fantastic. And it's, a, it's long overdue, but that's exactly what you do expect from the Jewish agency. Number two, it reflects a, uh, a sense within the um, Israeli uh, establishment. Sharansky obviously is the, the major figure here, but uh, it goes far beyond him, that uh, the health, security, and vitality of Israel presupposes a strong, healthy, and vibrant Jewish identity and Jewish communities in the diaspora. So in that respect, I think there's an element here of linking security issues to identity issues. And again, that's of enormous consequence. But thirdly, and again, relates to some of the issues I, I raised before, is that um, if our problems are basically those of uh, politics and security, we don't treat Israel as a mature democracy. In other words, if we regard Israel as fundamentally a beleaguered state, we're missing what Buddy refers to as what is really, what is really is Israel meant in terms of the Jewish, Jewish people. If our problems internally here in the States are those of assimilation, then it certainly is a, a major statement that our relationship with Israel now goes two ways, namely that American Jewry certainly should be there to support Israel on the political and, and security levels that we've always been there for. But Israel needs to be there for us uh, in terms of sustaining Jewish life and Jewish identity. So in that respect, I regard the development as entirely positive. Mm -hmm. The question is what will be the outcomes of it, and that I think we have to wait and see. Let me ask you one more question because of your position at the American Jewish Committee. Chelsea Clinton marries, she's a Methodist. She marries a Jew married by the Yale chaplain, Jewish chaplain at Yale. To what extent, as we end the first decade of the 21st century, is intermarriage seen within the Jewish community as the Shonda that it once was, to what extent is it now, in your view, a problem that the Jewish community must address, or as someone like Ed Case says, the more important question is, will the Jewish community be open, embracing, and welcoming of the non-Jewish partner in the yet-to-be intermarried couple? Okay, difficult questions, Mark. Um, first of all, I think you certainly, well, the easiest one is you can drop the word Shanda from the vocabulary. If anything, the problem's gonna be we won't know what Shanda means because it's too much of a Yiddishism. So that certainly is the, is the easiest one to answer. No, it certainly is not a Shanda in terms of the American Jewish mindset today. The Chelsea Clinton wedding was probably significant for two reasons, only one of which you alluded to. One, one major transformation relates to um, uh, Buddy's uh, late father, very dignified reform rabbi, though was the, the issue was the reform rabbi that was always opposed, in principle, to co-officiation. Um, 
What, uh, what was done at the Chelsea Clinton wedding was a sense of, um, you know, this is wonderful. We incorporate a little of column A and a little of column B. By the way, the Reconstructionist movement is still officially opposed to co-officiation. Okay, well, so is the reform movement. Yeah, yeah. But what oh, you're, yes? you're okay. describing is sociological exactly. reality. Exactly. Sociological, on the ground, there was very little in the way, there was a lot of private reaction to what uh, the Yale chaplain did. But publicly, it was a sense of, yes, that's where we've come to. The second issue is, um, the second aspect of it that is, uh, makes it a watershed is what you have alluded to frontally. Namely, um, uh, is intermarriage supposed to be seen uh, as a problem or as an opportunity? Notice I do not use the word Shanda, which I think no one is going to say I at this point you. except for certain circles on the right. Uh, if we miss the fact that it's a problem, then intermarriage will become normative. 90% you know, of American Jews should marry out because Jews are only 2% of the population. The moment it becomes that normative, you can't help but miss the fact this is very problematical for the Jewish future because it means intermarried couples are identifying only minimally. They don't stop being Jewish, but they identify only minimally with the Jewish community. Their children probably less so, and their grandchildren probably even less so. The blip on the screen, the positive dimension, is when conversion takes place. My problem with those who say it's, only, it's an opportunity rather than a problem, including the groups you referenced, is they no longer want to speak about conversion and they no longer want to speak about endogamy, about in marriage. We have to maintain three messages, and that is the first line of defense, if you will, is one to encourage Jews to marry other Jews. Secondly, when intermarriage takes place, the best possible outcome is the conversion of the non-Jewish spouse. When that's not in the cards, then we need to encourage children to be raised exclusively as Jews. And fourthly, perhaps the fourth message is, in terms of the way we operate, one of the reasons for not using the term shanda is that we want to operate on an inclusive basis and be open to all who wish to join the Jewish table, as we were discussing earlier with respect to J Street. We need to operate on a principle of inclusion. But that said, I would not lose sight of the other three principles, which are that of endogamy, conversion, and raising children exclusively as Jews. The Chelsea Clinton wedding, obviously, fine young couple, we should wish them luck. But certainly the co-officiation aspect does not suggest that children be raised exclusively within the Jewish faith and at this moment. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, all right, we have to close. I could talk to you guys forever and ever, but um, 2010 is over. We're looking at 2011. 30 seconds. As you look back on 2010, either... Ron, what will you remember or what would you like us to remember about 2010? Just how do you feel about this year that we've just ended? Um, I looked in uh, Wikipedia for 2010 before coming here, and then I edited the page for Israel, and there was almost nothing there. That was a bad thing. And I was concerned that, that we are sort of ending 2010 much the same situation as we began it. Uh, and I don't think the status quo is good for Israel, and it's not good for the American Jewish community within reference to Israel. So it was kind of a, a nothing year in many ways uh, that, that doesn't bode well for the future, and I hope we see a change in 2011. Buddy, your reaction to 2010? Um, in a line, I would say it is the year when we saw uh, a great defection of American Jews from their support for Barack Obama and even from their historic loyalty to the Democratic Party. Uh, the Pew poll showed this, uh, the series of articles by uh, Richard Chesnoff and Slate about buyer's remorse. Um, we are seeing uh, the, the Democrats went into the November 2010 elections hemorrhaging Jewish support. And I believe that that trend is continuing and, and frankly, I'm happy about it. Stephen, your reaction now to 2010, final I've, thoughts? I've got two uh, you know, very different but I think distinctive thoughts. Number one is that uh, notwithstanding all the issues we've been discussing around this table today, American Jews should continue to feel extremely comfortable as Americans. No society in diaspora Jewish history has been as welcoming of Jewish participation as has the United States. That has continued. You referenced the Chelsea Clinton wedding earlier. Yes, that's another symbol, of uh, another expression of that reality. Secondly, we spoke earlier about the Rotem bill and the controversy that arose. Again, I'd like to go on record to say we should remember from that, to take away from it, that uh, some measure of controversy in Jewish life is all to the good, that it's only a statement of how much we care about those issues. I frankly would have been far more appalled if the Rotem bill had simply come and gone and there had been no interest. The fact that we battle about these things is, is a statement of our passion, our concern, our deep care. 
and again, if you want again an optimistic note to take away from it, obviously the affair was deeply disturbing to many people, and it will continue to be with us for quite some time to come. But we should continue to express that passionate concern. Okay, my friend, wrap up 2010 and uh, begin I, I, 2011. I think American Jewry is, is fine, it's strong. I think, on the other hand, internationally, I think there has been a rise, a demonstrable rise in anti-Semitism. There have been attacks against Israel, uh, and it's going to continue. Uh, my dis I have a significant disappointment with the organized Jewish community for not taking up the fight. We know, as a Jewish community, we can document in conferences and in publications all the problems, all the anti-Semitism, all the attacks against Israel's legitimacy and demonization. What we haven't been doing, in my view, is taking action to counter it. It's not we are great in identifying it, and I ho I'm hoping that we'll improve and be a little more proactive in countering it, because a lot needs to be done. A nice way to begin 2011. Gentlemen, I cannot thank you enough. I love being with you. Buddy, from coming up to Philadelphia for me, thank you so Real, much. A great pleasure. I, I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Ron, I love when you come here. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me back. Means, and you know, I love you very, very much, and I love all the insight you bring, and you'll be well, and we'll see each other often in 2011. Absolutely. And Neil, you always belong in this seat. Thank you for, okay. you know, you've been here since we did the first round table, and I can't <laughs> thank you enough. My pleasure. All four of you, wonderfully done. And that was our discussion with Neil Schur, Buddy Korn, Ron Skolnick, and Stephen Bame. We hope you enjoyed hearing their thoughts on the events of Jewish importance for 2010 as we begin now a new decade of Jewish life. Of course, as always, we'd love to hear your thoughts. What do you think were the critical Jewish moments of 2010? Where do you feel we are as we begin 2011? and the second decade of the 21st century. Please email me or write me this week. And remember, you can all share your thoughts now on Shalom TV's Facebook page as well. So be in touch with me there. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. And we thank you for your kind support.